In this video, we're going to be looking at the novel The Good Soldier, and we'll put a typical trade version up against one from the Folio Society. For about twice the price, you can get quite the upgrade here. A Ford Maddox Ford's novel The Good Soldier was first published in 1915. It's often included in conversations of the greatest English novels of all time. While Ford is most remembered for his interactions with many other famous writers, the author's own contributions to literature can't be ignored, as both Parade's End and The Good Soldier are revered as classics. The Good Soldier is a first-person account of a rich American named John Dowell, who tells the story of he and his wife Florence's friendship with an English couple named Ashburnham. They're all relatively wealthy and live in Europe, meeting in a German spa town once every year. The narrator continually claims that they're all good people, but provides a fragmented story that indicates that they're anything but ideal. The novel is notable because it's one of the earliest and perhaps one of the best examples of the unreliable narrator. The book is dominated by an ironic narrative voice. Dowell is attempting to tell a story he knows almost nothing about. He lays out all the dots, but we get the feeling that he isn't equipped to connect them. There is a wry humor at play here as he bounces back and forth in time, rambling through asides and trying desperately to get his story back on track. He is a storyteller who is painfully struggling to tell and make sense of his own story. His narration is full of contradictions and this contributes to a mysterious and perhaps even ominous tone. It's a compelling and challenging early modernist novel. It feels kind of like you're reading an impressionist painting. All the little dabs of color are in place, perhaps right next to their contrasting color, but you need to step back from it and look again in order to make sense of how it all fits together. I first encountered the novel through this vintage international edition when I was too young a reader to fully appreciate it. The book is a trade version and features a great cover design with an image of a romantic exchange between a couple on a black background with some fancy flourishes and praise. It was printed in 1989 and has seen some water damage over the years. It opens not with an introduction, but an interpretation by Mark Shore. This runs for 11 pages and highlights the clever craftsmanship of the novel. Then we get Ford Maddox Ford's six-page dedicatory letter, which he added to the novel in 1927, 12 years after its initial publication. I'd always felt that this book went right over my head during my first reading of it, but deserved another attempt. So when I had the chance to upgrade to a more deluxe illustrated hardcover treatment, I decided to grab it. Let's do this. Here we have The Good Soldier from the Folio Society. This version was originally released in 2008 and is presented in a plain black slipcase. It has a cover designed by Philip Bannister. It features a stylized representation of the heart, blocked in black and gold on a grey cloth covered board. This design is perfectly appropriate because the novel discusses the literal human heart quite a lot, as many characters suffer from heart conditions. But they are also slaves to the metaphorical heart, as many seek out affairs as their own relationships are unfulfilling. The heart design carries right across the spine and stops before the plain back cover. On the spine, we note the author's name, the title, and the publisher. As sometimes occurs, the gold application does appear that it will wear more quickly than the other colors, so be sure to take care when handling it. The binding is finished with a black and silver headband. It remains a little tight here, despite being broken in beforehand and fully read through once. You'll probably see me wrestle with it a bit for the rest of the video. When we crack the book open, we see plain gray endpapers in a medium stock. The book is printed on Abbey Wove paper, which is smooth due to the fine wire mesh used in its production. The paper feels thicker here than it does in other comparable folio editions I've reviewed. It has plain, dedicated title pages for each of the novel's four parts, which are made up of between two and six chapters each. If we bring back the vintage edition for a brief side-by-side, -side, we can see that the Folio Society version is slightly bigger, with an extra 2.5 centimeters in height and almost 2 centimeters in width. The font size isn't any larger, but the darker ink and better quality paper make for a much stronger contrast in the Folio version. The text here is well-spaced with generous margins and is easy to read. The introduction is written by Julian Barnes, one of my favorite writers. Barnes explores some of the biographical uncertainties around Ford Maddox Ford, 
as well as the narrative uncertainties in this particular novel. This introduction is eight pages long and is fantastic. I hope we get more of Barnes in future folio releases. It's followed by Ford's dedicatory letter from 1927, just as it appears in the vintage edition. Philip Bannister provides seven interior illustrations. He's familiar to folio fans who may have seen his work on Sense and Sensibility, or in Robert Louis Stevenson selections like Treasure Island or Jekyll and Hyde. Mr. Bannister's watercolor work is typically focused on cityscapes and portraits. His work in The Good Soldier, however, leans appropriately towards an impressionistic quality, and is looser than it is in other pieces I've seen from him. The art is presented on a toothy, thicker stock, and the images usually land within 10 pages of the text they coincide with. Let's take a detailed look at the artwork now. The first illustration, the frontispiece, is a striking image of Florence Dowell frantically running through the lighted night streets. The ominous dark clouds above and Florence's black dress establish the darkness that pervades in this story. Mr. Bannister has captured the sense of movement and the low angle perspective adds to the powerlessness of the scene. The background features so much to look at. Cars, buildings, and other people. And that's true of many of the later illustrations too. But as we go through these, take note of how often Bannister depicts the characters as featureless or with their backs turned from the viewer. These are appropriate choices, as they echo John Dowell's own difficulty in pinning down who these people are. He remains blurry and obscured from the reader, and even from himself. The second piece is a depiction of John Dowell's first trip to England. He and Edward Ashburnham disembark from their horse-drawn cart as Leonora and her servants wait to greet them. The use of reds, browns, and greys gives scope and grandeur to the Bradshaw house, which extends up and out past the page. The third illustration is of a key scene where the Dowells and the Ashburnhams are looking at Martin Luther's original protest letter. Leonora bristles as Florence touches Edward's wrist. Our narrator detects something treacherous, something frightful, something evil in the gesture. And the artist's heavy shadows, due to the characters being backlit by the window, help convey this observation. The fourth image depicts a curious scene where our normally docile narrator acts with great violence. His servant, Julius, has dropped Florence's container of heart medicine, and John lashes out with pure anger. He believes that from then on, Florence feared that he would murder her in rage if he ever learned of her infidelities. The tension of the scene is conveyed in the characters' postures. More great costume work and more great background landscapes are evident here. The fifth illustration is a moment of stillness when Leonora and our narrator John Dowell reflect upon their recent tragedies in Leonora's study. The different eye level lines and the fact that they are looking in opposite directions help evoke the very different perspectives of each of these characters. The detailed rendering of Leonora's outfit is great, but I really like the impressionistic representation of the wallpaper in this image. The sixth image is of Nancy Rufford and John Dowell on a bench as they discuss the moral aspects of playing the lottery. Dowell's description of the beautiful and pure Nancy has come to life in the art here. Again, we've got other figures in the background and some more fantastic buildings. The final image is of Captain Edward Ashburnham in his study, oiling a gun. Leonora bursts in to check on him, and he looked up when she opened the door, his face illuminated by the light cast upward from round orifices of the green candled shades. There's a great attention to detail in this illustration, and the dark greens and browns in the background are magnificent in this piece, as they evoke the darkness that descends on this character. I am quite pleased with this copy of The Good Soldier. I happen to have the second printing from 2013 here, but that's fine with me. It is not currently available from Folio Society's website, so if you're looking to upgrade yourself, you have to turn to the secondary market, though it happens to be one of the best values out there. With some patience, you should be able to secure one for about $20 more than a new paperback edition will cost. With a wonderful introduction, fantastic illustrations, and a quality build, I'm happy to add it to my own collection, especially because I plan to revisit this challenging read yet again, as I find it a puzzling but compelling story, and I'm confident that this copy will hold up well to multiple readings. As for my trade edition, it's a trip to the Box of Doom for you, Perfect. because I need to make more room for more great books. As always, thanks for watching, and if you'd like more content, stay tuned to this channel or circle back to previous videos.